Howdy. Okay, here we're going to work through an example of an application of Neumann's rule. Now, make sure if you haven't seen it yet, you watch the video on uh, deriving Neumann's rule, so uh, you'll know where we're picking up from. But this basically picks up right where that left off. And the example we're going to think about is a fourfold rotation axis around lattice parameter U1. So this is a specific symmetry operation. Um, so the uh, figure on the left-hand side is showing our lattice uh, and an original uh, coordinate system. And then the right-hand side, we can see that we've applied that fourfold rotation, but because it's, uh, it's a symmetric structure looking down this axis, um, then the, the structure has remained unchanged. Um, so the question that we're asking is, what constraints does this symmetry operation, a single fourfold rotation, place on the property tensor? Again, the property tensor is this thing, sigma ij, and that's the thing that's relating, in this case, current density to electric field. So in the general sense, uh, this is a rank 2 tensor, or a second rank tensor, so there are nine independent elements in here. But what we're going to see is that because this structure has a particular symmetry operation, again, a single fourfold rotation axis um, down U1, that's going to severely restrict um, what uh, parameters uh, show up in this conductivity tensor. Um, and so basically it's going to limit um, the degree, independent degrees of freedom in here, and we're going to drastically um, reduce the scope of what this can look like. So let's go ahead, and what we need to remember in order to proceed is two things. One is how we transform our tensor from the tensor in the original um, components, uh, sorry, in the original coordinate system to the transformed coordinate system, uh, and that's this expression here. So whatever this uh, transformation matrix is A, um, we multiply A times the tensor times the inverse of A, and that's going to give us our transformed tensor. And the other thing we need to remember is that at the end of the day, because this A is a symmetry operation, um, the original tensor, the elements of the original tensor, have to equal the elements of the transformed tensor. And that's just because the, the thing looks the same before and after you've applied the rotation. And so basically the tensor that's describing the properties also has to look the same. So these are the two things. We're gonna apply uh, this, this top one first. Um, and in this case, again, we're doing a fourfold rotation around U1. And if you remember from your rotation matrices, um, if I'm applying a 90 degree counterclockwise rotation, this is what A looks like. Um, and the inverse of A is basically a 90 degrees clockwise rotation. Um, and I can double check this if I multiply A times its inverse, so A times A to the negative 1, that's the symbol that we use to describe the inverse matrix, then I should return the identity matrix. So this should return um, a diagonal matrix where the diagonals are 1. Um, and it, it does, but you can go ahead and check this if you want to make sure you're understanding. Okay, so then I need to apply this operation. So basically, transform the tensor from the original coordinate system to the new coordinate system. Um, and so basically, I've just written um, the matrix A is this first one. Uh, and I'm starting off with uh, the uh, conductivity tensor um, as it's originally written. Uh, and then I'm writing the inverse of A over here. And so it doesn't necessarily matter uh, the order. Uh, uh, well, let me let me uh, take this back. Because of the associative property, I could multiply a times sigma first, or I can multiply sigma times uh, the inverse of a first. In this case, I'm gonna I'm gonna multiply the product of these uh, first two three by three matrices, um, and that is going to return this element. So. You know, you can um, uh, work through this yourself just to make sure that you're getting there. Um, but what I've shown here is basically just the product of A times that original uh, conductivity tensor. Uh, so the next step then is going to be just the product of this guy uh, times the inverse of A. Uh, and that should give me um, this final uh, result. Um, and so again, this is basically what is the um, transformed conductivity tensor, but I'm still using all of these original variables. 
Um, so that's basically the first step. What does this transformed conductivity tensor look like? Um, and I'm going to rewrite this. So just to zoom back, all I'm doing is I'm rewriting this result up here, and then I'm reminding myself that the original conductivity tensor um, just looked like this. Um, and the next part of this is, again, the most important thing overall. And this is just saying that on an element-by-element -element basis, every element in the original uh, conductivity tensor should look the same as the element in the transformed tensor. And that's because this transformation, this fourfold rotation, has left the lattice invariant. It, it, once I apply the fourfold rotation, if I step back, it looks the same as if I had not applied the fourfold rotation at all. And so that's why each of the elements in the original conductivity tensor should equal the same element uh, in the transformed tensor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write these down one by one, right? So sigma, if I just say i equals 1, j equals 1, that means the top left element has to equal the top left element uh, in the transformed tensor. I could do this for the next one. Uh, if I have i equals 1, j equals 2, the, the middle top element of the original has to equal the middle top element of the transformed. And so now I can see I'm already starting um, to determine some relationships that might be useful in terms of scoping down what this looks like. So I'm going to write all of these down. Again, this is just pairwise listing every sigma ij equal to um, its, its uh, partner over here. So for example, uh, this bottom row is just for sigma uh, i equals 3, j equals 3. Um, that gives me sigma 3, 3 equals sigma 2, 2. OK, so that's step one. Write them all down. Oops. Step two is to think about how does this constrain the overall uh, conductivity tensor. And so what I'm going to show down here is basically as we go through these step by step, in some cases, it's not going to have too much effect. Um, but in other cases, it's going to limit what the value of one of these particular elements can be. Um, so for example, the very first step, sigma 1, 1 equals sigma 1, 1. That doesn't really show us anything new. Um, and so that does not place any additional constraints on this top left element of the conductivity tensor. Let's look at these next two relationships, though. Sigma 1, 2 equals negative sigma 1, 3. And sigma 1, 3 equals positive sigma 1, 2. So if I just take the bottom and I see um, I replace the sigma 1, 2 in here for the sigma 1, 2, then that gives me sigma 1, 3 equals negative sigma 1, 3. And it doesn't matter what this value of sigma 1, 3 is. The only way this can be true is if sigma 1, 3 equals 0. So the only number that is equal to the negative value of that number is 0. And so if sigma 1, 3 equals 0, uh, I can see from the second relationship that sigma 1, 2 equals 0. And so this is what I meant. Before, we had independent values. And now, because of this symmetry operation, these two elements of the conductivity tensor have to be 0. So I can keep working down. And I see another similar case. So sigma 2, 1 equals minus sigma 3, 1. But sigma 3, 1 equals positive sigma 2, 1. So this is the same scenario as above. The only case, if I substitute this bottom one in uh, for the top one, I replace sigma 2, 1 with sigma 2, 1. That gives me sigma 3, 1 equals negative sigma 3, 1. The only way that can be true is if sigma 3, 1 equals 0. And if sigma 3, 1 equals 0, then I can see from either of these relationships that sigma 2, 1 also has to equal 0. So that gives me a 0 element here and a zero element here. OK, the next one I come across is uh, this pair. So sigma 2, 3 equals minus sigma 3, 2. Sigma 3, 2 equals minus sigma 2, 3. Um, so if I do the same operation, if I uh, replace it back in, then all I would say is uh, minus sigma 3, 2 equals minus sigma 3, 2. So that doesn't tell me anything new. However, I know that these two uh, elements have to be uh, opposite um, uh, each other. So they have to be uh, equal to uh, the negative uh, of the other element. And so instead of having an independent uh, sigma 2, 3 and sigma 3, 2, I can rewrite this both in terms of a single parameter. So sigma 2, 3 up here 
and this would be negative sigma 2, 3. Uh, and finally, uh, I see sigma 2, 2 equals sigma 3, 3, and again, sigma 3, 3 equals sigma 2, 2. That just means that um, both of these values, the, the middle element uh, and the bottom right-hand element, have to be the same. And so you can call them whatever you want to call them, but I'm just going to call them sigma 2, 2. So we've gone from a case where we had uh, nine independent elements originally to something where now I really only have three independent elements. I have sigma 1, 1, I have sigma 2, 2, but this value down here also has to be sigma 2, 2. Uh, and then I have sigma 2, 3, but this element over here has to be negative sigma 2, 3. Um, so this has drastically reduced the scope. Now I'm going to point out really quick that this is the result of applying a single fourfold operation around U1. If I kept going, if I applied, if I walked through the same example and I applied two fourfold rotation steps or uh, three fourfold rotation steps, it turns out that I would constrain this matrix even further. So I'm not totally done yet, but this is just the example of the constraints that a single symmetry operation places on that property tensor.